Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth, the events coordinator for Gibson's Bookstore, and I am very pleased to welcome author Greg M. Peters, joining us this evening from Missoula, Montana, here to talk about his new book, Our National Forests. Our National Forests is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We are very happy to have you order online, over the phone, shop in person, and we do ship, and we do ship internationally. Um, Greg, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here and talk a bit about my book. It's called Our National Forest, Stories from America's Most in Public Lands. Um, and uh, I thought uh, probably the best way to talk about the book um, would be actually to share a, a presentation that I developed. Um, and so I'm going to do that. Um, I've got a PowerPoint. And uh, one of the main reasons I wanted to develop a PowerPoint and share that is the book is um, filled with about 150 photographs that um, highlight the, the really stunning beauty of uh, the national forests and, uh, <clears throat> and just how diverse they are. So I thought um, it would be really helpful um, to, to share some of those photos and some of the captions that, uh, that I wrote for those photos. So the presentation is going to kind of move through the book um, and also feature some of the photographs from the book um, as a way to uh, highlight just the amazing beauty uh, and, and diversity of landscapes that, that these national forests encompass. So without further ado, um, I am going to share my screen and get started with the presentation and uh, talking about my book. Thanks again for joining. I'm really excited to be here. Okay. This may take just a moment. Um, Elizabeth, can you see that screen? Maybe give me a, a thumbs up or something if you can. I can see it. Fantastic. Well, hopefully everybody else can as well. Um, so I am Greg Peters. Um, I, I use uh, the M um, because in Missoula, though it is a relatively small town, there are actually two other Greg Peters. Um, and it is, uh, it's a little confusing. So uh, I started using the M a while ago, and I've stuck with it. So anyway, um, my, uh, my my nom de plume, I guess, so to speak, is Greg M. Peters, but I just go by Greg. Um, and uh, just a quick uh, couple of snapshots of, of stuff that I like to do. This is me out on the Lolo National Forest. All of these are actually from national forests. Um, and there's my dog Murphy. We're doing some backcountry skiing. Um, this one here is a is a in the lower left is a photo of uh, a backpacking trip that I did uh, just this past fall uh, again on the Lolo in an area called the Great Burn Wilderness Study Area, which is a really uh, pretty special landscape um, just uh, west here uh, of, of Missoula, Montana. And then that final photo um, is me from uh, from what feels like a lifetime ago um, doing a, a really cool trip in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later on, um, where we uh, we hiked in for a couple of days and then uh, used pack rafts to float uh, the South Fork of the Flathead River um, for four more days uh, and cut through the Bob Marshall. It was a really cool trip. Um, and then, of course, uh, the, the cover of the book here as well. Um, so... Uh, I think it probably makes a lot of sense and, and folks there are probably familiar uh, more so than than in other areas of the country um, with national forests, but uh, I wanted to start with a, a brief uh, slide on just what national forests are. Um, and so they are, of course, public lands. Uh, they are managed by the U.S. Forest Service, um, which is housed under the Department of Agriculture um, and has been uh, since 1905. Um, and um, there are multiple use lands, uh, and, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. And uh, also, as I mentioned, they're really, really diverse, um, both from a, a landscape a ecosystem standpoint, a, a scenic value standpoint, um, and uh, just from a, a use standpoint. So those multiple uses that uh, forest service lands or national forests are, are managed for um, encompass uh, several different things. Um, first and foremost um, is natural resource development. So this is when we're talking timber harvesting, oil and gas development, uh, hard rock mining, uh, hydrological power, things like that. Um, that's an important uh, use of our of our national forests, and uh, that's different than national parks. And, and I will speak specifically to the differences between the two in a moment, but. Um, 
but yeah, so that that natural resource extraction is a, is a big thing. Um, grazing uh, for cattle and sheep is another uh, important use of our national forests. In, in fact, um, about half of the landscape uh, that in, that uh, makes up the national forest system, um, which is 193 million acres, uh, about half of that is considered grazing land. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well, uh, a little farther in the presentation. Um, obviously, and, and folks in New Hampshire are probably really familiar with this aspect, um, national forests are managed for recreation. Um, that's both motorized and non-motorized, um, wilderness recreation, uh, where you can't even use a mountain bike, um, and, and all kinds of recreation in between, from fishing to camping, backpacking, rock climbing. Um, there are 120 ski resorts that operate on national forests, and including some uh, of the bigger ones there in New Hampshire. Um, <clears throat> And so skiing is, is another big, uh, important recreational use of national forests. And that's actually how I uh, first experienced national forests. Though I grew up in Maine, um, we were uh, more of a coastal family and didn't quite uh, make it over to that little part of the White Mountain that uh, extends into Maine, um, which I regret uh, <laughs> and something I need to remedy. Um, but I, I did get my first uh, experience on a national forest through skiing, uh, actually, as, as a youth, uh, when my family took me out to uh, Utah for a ski trip. Um, wildlife and fish habitat is another really important uh, component of, of uh, those uses, um, as is water provision. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And uh, just I sort of lumped other ecosystem services together, and those include carbon storage, uh, pollution control, flood control, uh, all those kinds of things as well. Uh oh, why won't it let me move? There we go. Okay. So to understand how national forests came about, um, I thought this photo uh, was a good one to show. This is, uh, it's from the book. It's a historical photo. Oh, geez. Now I'm doing a slideshow. Oh boy. More, uh, what have I done now? Excuse me while I learn how to use PowerPoint briefly. Boy, we're really, um, we're really doing some good technical difficulties here, Elizabeth, between you and I. Okay. Together, we will figure this out. We will. <laughs> For some reason, the captions are on. That's exciting. Okay. I like captions, honestly. It helps me focus on the, uh, it helps me focus <laughs> on the actual content instead of uh, auditory processing disorder. Okay, we're going to try this again, and hopefully it will work. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, to, to understand uh, why National Forests came about, how they came about, I think it's important to understand a little bit of the history of uh, how the U.S. Uh, treated its, its lands uh, in the early to mid-1800s. Um, and this photo is from the book, um, and it is from okay. Michigan. Which I don't see a photo now. Can you reshare uh, re your PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, you having fun yet? Yeah, <laughs> I actually didn't know that a lot of national forests were utilized for um, resource management. So I'm yes. interested to hear about this. All right, let's see. There we go. Is that working? Yes, I see your screen and I've got the book cover and yourself and your dog. What are national forests? Great. And now we've okay. got a blogging team. Yes. Right. We are um, so this is a... Thank you. Um, this is an historic photo from Michigan, um, and it's a it's a good way, I think, to highlight um, what some of our lands looked like um, in the late mid late 1800s basically um, and particularly in the east uh, a lot of these lands were, were pretty heavily cut over um, new hampshire was no exception to this and so as america was moving west um, and starting to uh, take stock of the lands that it owned in the west um, they were coming from a lot, a lot of the folks in, in the federal government were uh, were seeing what was happening in the east and they didn't want that to happen in the west um, they didn't want uh, to just give these lands over to private interests wholesale and and uh, turn them over to timber harvesting and and mining and things like that um, because they had seen some of the devastation that had occurred uh, in the east and in the midwest uh, in the mid 1800s so Briefly, um, <laughs> a bit of a history here, and I know there's a lot of bullets and a lot of words on this, but I'm just going to highlight a few things. So um, 
the whole concept of, of understanding what these Western lands were uh, started in, in basically 1876 um, when uh, the Department of Agriculture sent uh, some folks west to get it get a handle on the extent and and uh, and the resources that that these vast lands contained. Um, in 1891, Congress passed the Forest Reserve Act, which allowed the president to set aside some of these lands from what was called the public domain. These were all the lands uh, basically in the West that the federal government owned um, and say, we're going to uh, take some of these and we're going to turn them into forest reserves. Um, this would be instead of giving them to homesteaders through the Homestead Act or to railroads or to states uh, or territories or to uh, private timber uh, or other uh, private industrial interests. Um, and so that kicked off the process of setting aside some of these lands in the West. Um, it wasn't until a few years later when Congress actually directed uh, what it wanted those lands to be used for. And I, I bring this up because it's a really important uh, part of uh, what is still the Forest Service's mission. And um, this, this direction is considered the organic act of the Forest Service, sort of the, the foundational act of, uh, well, of the Forest Service, and, although it's a little nuanced, but of the way that national forests should be managed. And the quote is uh, from the act um, is to improve and protect the forest within the reservation, uh, securing favorable conditions of water flows, and to furnish a continuous supply of timber for the use and necessities of citizens of the United States. So already you start to see uh, in 1897, this notion of multiple use. These lands are gonna be used for water provision. They're gonna be used for timber harvesting. Um, and that really sort of sets the foundation for how national forests are gonna be managed in the future. Um, our current national forest system really stems from 1905, when the Forest Service was created under Teddy Roosevelt um, and led by Gifford Pinchot, the first chief of the forester, and you'll hear a little bit more about him in a moment. Um, and then <clears throat> eastern forests, including the White Mountain, they came about in 1911 after uh, a gentleman named John Weeks, uh, and again, I'll speak to him a little bit more later, um, who's a representative from Massachusetts, so he was originally from New Hampshire. Um, he had seen some of the devastation. He had a summer home up near the White Mountains, and uh, he had seen some of the devastation that, that was occurring there from the industrial timber harvests of the time. And, uh, and, and created a law that allowed the federal government to purchase private lands from private owners and bring them into the federal estate. Prior to that, the, the uh, federal government couldn't purchase lands from private entities and add them to the federal estate. They could only take those public domain lands that I mentioned earlier and add them to the federal estate. Um, and so uh, in 1911, we see uh, the start of the Eastern Forest coming into the national forest system. And then the final uh, law that I want to point out is uh, in 1937, and it's the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act, which uh, is not a very uh, interesting sounding name. And it did two things. One, um, it set up a credit program for tenant farmers to be able to purchase land. Um, and this was a new deal program. Um, so obviously the, the Dust Bowl was a huge issue at this time um, and tenant farming was, was unsustainable and untenable for those folks. Um, so that was an important piece of, of the legislation, but it also um, furthered that, uh, that authorization of the federal government to purchase private lands. Um, but, but this time it focused them on um, <clears throat> degraded uh, uh, Great Plains grasslands that had been plowed up um, and that actually in effect created the Dust Bowl. Um, and so uh, starting after, the, after 1937, the federal government um, ended up purchasing some of these lands, implemented some um, restoration practices on them. And in 1960, uh, those lands were, were officially brought into the national forest system and they were called national grasslands. And right now there are uh, 20 of those actually spread around the country. So that history gets us to the national forest system that we have today. And, and this map highlights uh, where national forests are. Um, you can see uh, the green are national forests, the gold are national grasslands. Um, and you can see that it is a predominantly a Western phenomenon, but there are plots of national forests in the East and uh, some of the most beloved public lands uh, in the federal public land system are some of these national forests in the East as well. Um, so all told, the system is 193 million acres, which is just massive. Um, it's split into 175 units, which is an administrative designation. Um, 155 of those are what we sort of know and consider are, are as national forests, like the White Mountain National Forest. Um, 20 of them are national grasslands. 
Um, and there's one national tall grass prairie, uh, which exists in, uh, in Illinois. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and as you can see uh, from the map, they stretch from Alaska to Puerto Rico. Um, and as I mentioned, they're not all forests. And so to give you uh, some idea of uh, what some of these other national forests and, and other units look like, um, I'm going to cycle through a few photos here um, for you and uh, th that just highlight some of this diversity. Um, so, you know, in Arizona on the Coconino National Forest, uh, you got Cathedral Rock. Um, that doesn't look like uh, a hardwood forest that you'd find there in New Hampshire by any stretch. Um, and uh, it's just an amazing landscape. Um, in Florida, uh, you've got these uh, warm water, freshwater springs, like like the Silver Glen Springs here in this uh, photo from the Ocala National Forest in, in north central Florida. Um, I mentioned grasslands. This is the Dakota Prairie grasslands that covers parts of uh, North and South Dakota. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, there's no forest there at all. There are no trees. Um, so uh, again, a really amazing example of some of this diversity. Um, Puerto Rico uh, has its own uh, tropical national forest called El Yunque, and uh, there's a, a neat history here. This forest reserve was actually set aside um, by the King of Spain um, long before Puerto Rico became a territory of the United States, and uh, folks in Puerto Rico uh, take great pride uh, in this forest um, and, and in the amenities and, and uh, natural resources that it provides. There's an endemic parrot called, uh, I think, the Puerto Rican parrot um, that lives there that, that's pretty special as well. Um, it's a it's a neat place, one I'd love to visit. Um, the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area um, is a really cool uh, national forest um, <laughs> that's not really a forest. Again, um, it's managed by the Forest Service under a really interesting management scheme um, that I get into in the book and I'll share a little bit about later on. Um, but it is just an amazing landscape just, uh, just east of Portland, Oregon, uh, along the Col Columbia River. Just east of Los Angeles uh, and 15 million people is the Angeles National Forest. And uh, it's made up of chaparral, which is like a Mediterranean uh, ecosystem of uh, shrubs and, and fire prone uh, vegetation like that. And also, um, you know, traditional conifer trees that we, we, we would think of. Uh, and it's one of the most urban forests in the country. Um, it's a really neat spot. Down in Arizona, again, you've got the Coronado, um, which is uh, a forest of saguaro cacti um, and uh, just a, a completely different landscape than, um, than the, you know, what we think of as traditional forests. Um, one other point is that these forests touch the ocean on both the Pacific and the Atlantic side. Uh, this is the Sayus Law in Oregon, um, and then uh, the, the Croatan and a couple others uh, on, the, on the East Coast uh, touch the Atlantic Ocean as well. Um, so it really does stretch uh, kind of from coast to coast. Um, and, and, you know, in the Midwest, we think farms, we think uh, flat, you know, fields of corn. Um, this is the Shawnee National Forest in Illinois, the Garden of the Gods, a really cool uh, example of, of just uh, some of the landscapes there that, that national forests encompass. Uh, of course, south of you, um, those, those, hard, those hardwood forests continue. Um, the Nantahala Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina, uh, just over a million acres. Uh, a really interesting backstory here, a story of, of restoration um, that I'll share a little bit, um, but also a beautiful landscape. And then, of course, probably many of you are familiar with this view from Franconia Ridge there on Mount Garfield uh, in the White Mountain National Forest. And then finally, uh, one of my favorite forests and a local forest to me, the Lolo National Forest. Um, and, uh, and the caption here, I think, uh, summarizes uh, the point that uh, our national forests include a wide variety of landscapes, uh, but really at the end of the day, uh, for most of them, trees, trees do dominate, despite some of the diversity that I just highlighted. Um, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, a lot of times folks wonder what the difference between national parks and national forests are. It's a great place to start um, a discussion about, about national forests. And one, uh, when I worked at, at a conservation nonprofit called the National Forest Foundation, uh, it was one we often found ourselves having with, with our constituents, with our members, uh, and just with the public at large. Um, so national parks uh, generally uh, embody a concept of preservation uh, that was articulated by, by John Muir. Um, national forests, uh, on the other hand, embody uh, a vision of, of conservation, which was articulated by Gifford Pinchot, the first chief of the Forest Service uh, in 1905. 
um, national parks are, are, are managed for that preservation ethos. Uh, they're managed to preserve ecosystems, to preserve uh, wildlife populations and views. And, and that's really what they're set up to do. Uh, there's no timber harvesting. There's no hunting with, I think, maybe some minor exceptions up in Alaska. Um, you know, there's fishing, but uh, I think it's all catch and release for the most part. Um, and so, you know, Meanwhile, national forests, as I mentioned, are managed for those co-equal multiple uses that include timber harvesting, mining, uh, you know, recreation, and, and all those other things as well. Um, the National Park Service was established in 1916. The National Forest Service, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, excuse me, was established in 1905. Uh, so it, it, it uh, preceded the, the National Park Service by 11 years. Um, the Park Service and National Parks are managed by the Department of Interior, um, and uh, the Park Service has about 12,000 employees. Uh, meanwhile, the Forest Service and National Forests are uh, an agency uh, under the Department of Agriculture, and uh, they have about 30,000 employees. Um, so, you know, you've got a, a much larger land set. Um, you've got uh, 193 million acres of land in the, in the National Forest System versus 85 million acres in the National Park System. Uh, and so you've got, uh, I guess, almost double the, a uh, little more than double the, the number of employees tasked with managing those. Um, and then the last couple of bullets here, I think, speak to the to the recreational assets. I think a lot of folks think of these iconic backpack trips and, and these vacations that they take um, that happen in national parks. And they think, boy, national parks are just the, the place to go for outdoor based recreation. And they are. And, and I love the time that I get to spend in national parks. They're absolutely stunning. But uh, you've got about 12,000 miles of trail uh, based on the statistic I could find in 2008 uh, in the national park system. Uh, our national forests have hundred and almost 160,000 miles of trails, um, and uh, almost 100,000 of those are non-motorized, 60,000 of those are motorized, and 31,000 miles of those trails are in wilderness. Um, and I don't know if you've ever done a, a backpacking trip, um, but you know, six, eight miles a day, maybe 10 if you're pretty fit is a pretty long day. Um, you know, there's, there's 98,000 miles of trails that you can uh, walk on in national forests. So it would take a lifetime to cover them all. Um, and then uh, again, I think this is a bit of a recreational infrastructure, but also um, a bit of that natural, uh, natural resource development infrastructure. Um, there's 8,500 miles of roads in national parks. Um, and there are more than 350,000 miles of roads in national forests. It's almost 11 times uh, the interstate highway system. So the infrastructure, the trails, the roads, the management of national forests is just, uh, it's just more complicated, I think, at the end of the day um, than that of national parks. Um, you know, some other differences, most national forests don't have an entrance gate. You don't have to talk to a ranger when you want to uh, when you want to travel onto a national forest. Uh, you show up at a parking lot at a trailhead. Uh, if there's a parking fee, you pay that, and then and then you move on. Um, this photo is the Maroon Bells. It's it's from Colorado, um, and uh, there's a quote that this particular uh, these particular mountains are are some of the most photographed mountains in the country. And uh, I think uh, this photo uh, suggests why. Um, and, and I put this in here to highlight um, the, the visual splendor that national forests have uh, rivals, I think, that of national parks in, in many ways. I mean, I've certainly mentioned that already. Um, but I, I did want to share this photo in particular just because I think it's so stunning. So I mentioned a little bit earlier, John Muir and Gifford Pinchot. Um, here's a couple of photos of these two guys, uh, one from 1902 of John Muir and one from Gifford Pinchot, 1909. Um, and <clears throat> Gifford Pinchot, in, in establishing this concept of conservation, he borrowed from an English philosopher named Jeremy Bentham, who uh, created a, a philosophy, I guess, called utilitarianism, um, which is basically that something is considered moral or good uh, when it benefits uh, the most people that it can benefit. Um, and Pinchot uh, took this concept and modified it a little bit and applied it to national forests. And he did so through a letter that he wrote to some of the early forest rangers in the early 1900s. And it was a bit of an instruction. And the quote is, where conflicting interests must be reconciled, the question shall always be answered from the standpoint of the greatest good of the greatest number in the long run. And that uh, ethos, that greatest good, 
greatest number in the long run is really what uh, drove early national forest management. Um, and I think in a lot of ways still drives uh, national forest management. And it really speaks to that concept of conservation. Um, and it speaks to the fact that we can have timber harvests and we can have uh, healthy water, we can have wildlife habitat, and we can have uh, grazing. And that's what national forests are supposed to try to provide. I, mean, I don't think they always uh, provide that. Certainly, um, sometimes these, these conflicts bump up against each other. But um, I wanted to share that quote as sort of a, a founding uh, principle of, of national forest management um, and of the, the U.S. Forest Service. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you to try to keep track of time a little bit for me, and, and maybe as I get close to uh, to the half hour, 35-minute uh, note, uh, you, can give me, you can give me a little heads up, if you don't mind. You got um, it. To our audience member, you. if you have questions that you would like to ask, uh, please do pop them into the chat sidebar or the Q&A box. We already have one. Where is Lolo? Uh, it's in Montana. It's in um, basically west central Montana. It's uh, about, I think it's a couple million acre national forest. Beautiful. Thank right outside you. my door. You. You're welcome. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out um, about national parks and national forests uh, is that many of our most iconic national parks are either surrounded by or bordered by a national forest. And I think they work in concert in a lot of ways. The forests provide a bit of a buffer, both from a recreational standpoint um, and from a wildlife standpoint. Um, and they also allow uh, those, those uh, ecosystems to, to stretch across um, human-made boundaries. When we say this is a national park, it's set aside. Um, well, the trees and the, and the animals, they don't recognize that, obviously. And so um, these buffer zones, uh, which is a little reductionist for the national forest, but it, it's a convenient way of thinking about it, um, they really do provide um, they really do provide that genetic exchange. They provide a, a lot of those ecosystem services to exist in a larger way than they could uh, if those national parks were just completely surrounded by private land. One of the best examples of this is this, um, this image that I have here. So the dark green in the center of that is Yellowstone National Park um, in Wyoming, uh, cuts into Idaho and, and Montana a little bit. And then um, the lighter green and the white are the five uh, forests that surround uh, Yellowstone. And this whole zone is called the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And, uh, and there's an effort uh, through partnerships to manage this ecosystem um, as that, as an entire ecosystem and not just manage Yellowstone Park um, or manage the Custer Gallatin National Forest or the Bridger Teton National Forest independently from each other, but to manage them all together. And so I think it's a great example of, uh, again, that, that uh, connection between national forests and national parks. Um, and as you can see on this list here, um, there are a lot of other uh, national parks that, that also border uh, national forests. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to shift a little bit now uh, after that introduction and start talking a little bit more specifically about the book. Um, one of the first chapters in the book is called No Forests, No Water, the story of Eastern forests. And uh, this photo here is in the book. It's from a flood in Pittsburgh uh, that happened in 1907, I think. Um, maybe it was 1908. Um, and it was attributed to, uh, to the, the degradation of forests in the, in the watershed um, upstream and, and at higher elevation of Pittsburgh. Um, and there's long been a connection between um, water and forests. Um, if, if we don't have forested cover in those high elevation watersheds, rain falls, snow melts, it runs right into the stream, it erodes, it carries with it disease, it carries with it um, sediment, uh, it fouls the streams, it, it causes problems for downstream communities. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, this gentleman from New Hampshire made some money in business and moved to Massachusetts, uh, decided to have a political career. I'm sure that story is uh, not unique to John Weeks, um, but nonetheless, a um, uh, successful businessman turned, uh, turned congressman. Um, he was tasked with uh, creating uh, the legislation that would allow the federal government to purchase and protect uh, these, uh, these eastern forests. They weren't really forests at the time because they had been mostly cut over, um, but the intent was to protect those water supplies and improve conditions for downstream communities. Um, and so uh, Weeks actually found a way to do this uh, through the Interstate Commerce Act, um, which was a, a piece of legislation 
legislation that allowed Congress to control trade across state lines. And so through that, he was able to uh, find the legal footing for this, uh, the Weeks Act, and that was passed in 1911. Uh, and the Forest Service, uh, in fact, did start purchasing those lands um, and reforesting them and turning them into uh, what we now uh, know of as the Eastern National Forests. And, and I think uh, Hopefully folks on, on this presentation uh, are appreciative of, of uh, John Weeks and what he did and of uh, the federal government's role in protecting those forests. Um, while this image is, is not uh, from the east, um, it's from the Columbia River Gorge, um, it does, I think, just highlight you know, the, the importance of water and the beauty of water on national forests. And um, I also think it's really important. Um, this is a, a photo I took uh, of a moose. I had a telephoto lens, fortunately. Um, this is in Georgetown Lake on the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest here in Montana. Um, I was out paddleboarding one morning and, and this moose came up and uh, drank for about a minute straight. Uh, it was pretty cool. So I was able to snap some photos. Um, and moose aren't the only uh, the only species that rely on water from national forests. Uh, that may seem like kind of a silly statement. Obviously, wildlife and fish rely on water, but um, 68 million Americans rely on water that comes directly from national forests. Um, that's uh, in 3,400 communities in cities as big as Atlanta, Denver, um, Portland, Oregon, Los Angeles, I mentioned earlier, and in small communities like Missoula. And, uh, and I think that uh, that statistic is really, uh, really important and, and something that really drives home uh, just how important these national forests are. You know, if we don't have good, clean water that's inexpensive, uh, we're in a world of hurt. Um, and so those forested watersheds uh, are crucially important to the country uh, just, just from a water provision standpoint. Um, the next chapter in the book uh, tells the story of um, reforestation, which is something that the Forest Service does. Um, this photo here is of some seedlings in, uh, in a Forest Service nursery out in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is about two hours uh, west of where I live here in Missoula, Montana. Um, and uh, this is a, r a really amazing story, and, and I'll touch on it briefly. Um, but obviously, uh, when there's wildfires, uh, if there are uh, hurricanes and, and, and other storm events, uh, they cause tree loss and deforestation. And the Forest Service, in largely because of those watershed uh, values, works hard to, to reforest those uh, after, after those things happen to get trees planted out there. And so they do this um, uh, through harvesting cones, um, primarily for conifer trees from cone orchards that they maintain. Uh, all of these trees are grown from cones at specific elevations, um, in specific zones, the, they're all native species. The Forest Service uh, maintains cone, cone orchards where they grow trees specifically to harvest their cones. Um, they then uh, separate those, seed, those seeds from the cones. Uh, they plant them out in these nurseries that I mentioned. Um, and then uh, after a couple of years of, of growing those seedlings, they, uh, they deliver them to a particular forest uh, that needs uh, that particular species uh, of that elevation, et cetera. Um, and they're planted on the forest by hand, uh, by, by planting crews. And these nurseries can grow uh, literally millions of seedlings a year. Um, and they're also required to have a 10 year supply of seeds in a, a seed bank, um, which is a, a walk-in cooler, a huge walk-in cooler where are there these giant uh, tubs of, uh, of packaged seeds that they keep frozen uh, in the event that they need them uh, you know, for some emergency down the line. This whole program, this whole reforestation program was actually started in an unlikely place, uh, and it's kind of a cool story, and it was started by this gentleman named Charles Bessie. Uh, he was a, a horticulture professor and botanist uh, at the University of Nebraska, and in the early 1900s, he was convinced that the Great Plains once um, actually were forested. And he, uh, he got the ear of, uh, of the Forest Service um, and uh, got the go ahead uh, to find some land and to grow some trees and to prove that, uh, that the Great Plains could once again um, support trees. Um, and that actually, those efforts, uh, this is an early uh, planting effort here on the Dismal River Forest Reserve, uh, which is a precursor to the Nebraska National Forest that we have today. Um, these early efforts really kind of launched the, the Forest Service reforestation program. Um, so it, it was uh, not originally necessarily to, um, to react to forest fires or to be able to replant forests when it was started. It was, uh, it was actually an afforestation effort um, to return, uh, quote, the Great Plains back to a forested state. Um, 
It didn't work uh, entirely, although um, the Halsey National Forest uh, in Nebraska um, is considered the second largest hand planted forest uh, in the world, actually. Um, and now there's actually an interesting effort to, uh, to remove trees from the Great Plains because they're encroaching on grasslands and uh, jeopardizing some uh, grassland dependent wildlife and, uh, and, and ranching and uh, other communities uh, in the Great Plains as well. So uh, full circle on that story, uh, but an interesting one nonetheless that I, that I thought was important to get into in the book. Um, here's another image of uh, the Coeur d'Alene Nursery. Um, it's a really neat kind of uh, mashup of uh, sort of bootstrapped engineering, kind of homespun engineering, and uh, some pretty high tech uh, engineering as well, you know, with, with greenhouses and climate control and, and precision watering and all that kind of stuff. It's a pretty cool facility. And there are six others um, around the country. Um, the the next chapter in the book is called From the Dust Bowl to Medewin. And uh, this is a picture of Medewin. Medewin is a, the national tall grass prairie in Illinois that I mentioned. Um, and it has a really unique backstory. And I used that, uh, that backstory and the Dust Bowl to kind of highlight how grasslands became part of the national forest system, uh, something I mentioned early at the top. Um, so obviously, the Dust Bowl folks are probably familiar, at least peripherally, with that. Um, this photo is from 1938. Um, showing some of the damage there uh, caused by the Dust Bowl. Um, this photo is of Medewin. Um, and so um, in, in the 1940s, um, the Department of Defense actually built two uh, huge munitions uh, factories at Medewin. It's a 20,000 acre uh, plot of land near Joliet, Illinois, about an hour south of Chicago. Um, and it manufactured TNT and the bombs uh, that TNT goes in. Um, I think at the highlight, or at the, I think cumulatively, they made like 2 billion tons of TNT or something like that from the 1940s up until um, the 1970s. It was decommissioned, um, and in the 1990s, it was given to the Forest Service. And uh, today, um, it is a 20,000 acre tract of public land, and the Forest Service is uh, working really hard to, uh, to restore this back to a national tall grass prairie. And that story echoes what uh, the Forest Service did with um, the lands uh, from that first photo that I showed uh, of the Dust Bowl. Um, when it took uh, when it, when the after the New Deal, some of these laws that were passed, the Bankhead Jones Act, um, the Forest Service worked with uh, the Soil Conservation Service and some other uh, agencies under the Department of Agriculture to rehabilitate rehabilitate these these blown over lands and turn them into uh, into productive grasslands. Um, and Medewin is more uh, is a modern version of that. Uh, only instead of the Dust Bowl, um, it was a military industrial complex that that uh, and and their effects on the land that the agency is now trying to heal. And one of the coolest stories, uh, coolest parts of, of Medewin, um, in addition to the, the native tall grass prairie plants that, that are growing there now, um, is uh, are these guys. Um, and so in, uh, in 2016, I think it was, um, the National Forest Foundation worked with Medewin and, uh, and a private owner uh, out of South Dakota to bring a herd of uh, 27 bison to Medewin. Um, they had, uh, bison uh, obviously had been part of the landscape there uh, for millennia uh, and had been extirpated. And so we brought them back, uh, built a, a big pasture. And uh, now I think there are, gosh, I think there's probably more than 90 bison there. Um, it's a pretty cool success story. And uh, it's drawing a lot of folks from Chicago uh, down to visit Medewin and increasing visitation there. And it's just a really neat story. Um, I'm going to close this uh, brief section here with, uh, with this photo of the Pawnee National Grasslands. Um, again, just really highlighting, uh, you know, this aspect of the national forest system um, that folks uh, may be less familiar with. Okay, the original people's lands. Um, so, can't talk about national forests, I uh, can't really talk about America without addressing uh, where we got this land. Um, and so in one chapter of the book, I do that. Um, and I speak to uh, the sad legacy of, of our country's treatment of Native Americans. Um, and uh, I focus on a, on a landscape here in Montana called the Badger to Medicine, uh, which this is a photo of. Um, and I highlight some other stories uh, from the past. Um, you know, the Black Hills uh, were sacred to Native Americans. Uh, right now, this is a, a photo of, of the Black Hills National Forest. Um, 
And the Black Hills were given to Native Americans in perpetuity through a treaty. Um, and then uh, gold was discovered shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, white settlers moved in uh, by hook or by crook or violence, uh, took a lot of those lands. The federal government came in, uh, established a national forest there. Uh, recall that you know mining is one of the uses on national forests. So just by establishing a forest there didn't necessarily mean that it would prevent uh, mining. Um, but this story uh, was repeated again and again, unfortunately, in, in our history. Uh, lands given to Native Americans and then taken away again through a lot of different policies. Um, that being said, uh, there have been partnerships, uh, historic and lots more current, uh, between the Forest Service and, uh, and Native Americans. Um, this photo is from a berry hunting camp um, or huckleberry camp uh, on the Kootenai National Forest here in Montana um, from 1938. Um, and the next couple photos are from a project uh, that was actually a CCC era project from the New Deal from, from uh, the late 1930s, uh, where the Forest Service uh, hired um, totem pole carvers uh, in Alaska to restore totem poles that had fallen into disrepair. Um, and it's a really cool project where um, they were able to both restore these totem poles and pass the, the skills of totem carving on to, uh, to others um, at a time when they were starting to lose those skills. Um, and the gentleman named Theodore Catton um, tells a, a really uh, detailed uh, provides a really detailed review of, of national forests and, uh, and Native Americans in his book, uh, American Indians and the National Forests, from which I drew uh, a fair bit of the material for my chapter. So if folks are interested in learning more about that, um, I would definitely check, check that book out. Um, at the end of the day, um, both through uh, policies and, and, and uh, intentional and, and, and even well-meaning, but, but still um, unfortunate events, uh, Native Americans lost all, all, all of the land uh, that they once uh, lived on, um, but in particular, they even lost a lot of the land that had been ceded to them through treaties, um, and some of that became uh, some of the national forests that we know today. That we know today, and, and I do cover some of that specifically in the book. Um, all right, on to a, a, a maybe a, a slightly uh, more positive, uh, at least. Uh, more modern, modern positive story, uh, crowd control, recreation on national forests. Um, I love this photo just because it, it shows that uh, recreation has been around for a long time on national forests. And uh, I really appreciate the technical outerwear that these gentlemen are wearing uh, for their foray here into the, into the national forest. Um, this historic photo as well, I think does a great job of, uh, of highlighting uh, an issue that I'm sure many, many folks participating are, are familiar with, uh, parking. Parking can be really challenging uh, when you get to that trailhead and, uh, and you can't find a dang place to park. Uh, and, and that has plagued um, national forests since the 1930s, as this photo shows. Um, <clears throat> this photo is from uh, the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness on the Custer Gallatin and Shoshone National Forest. Uh, it's from a, a skiing trip that I was fortunate enough to, to join uh, a few winters ago. Again, it just highlights the recreation opportunities. I spoke a little bit to recreation earlier in my comparison between national parks and national forests, but um, National forest recreation is is absolutely amazing. Um, you, there are very few rules relatively. Um, there aren't that many regulations relatively. Um, I mean, this is a, in a general sense. Obviously, there are places where certain things are prohibited and certain certain things are allowed. Um, but as a general rule, and in comparison to other sets of public lands, whether they're state parks or, or national parks or uh, municipal parks. Um, national forests have a much more relaxed attitude towards recreation. Um, you can ride ATVs, you can motorboat, you can land a plane, uh, you can do all kinds of things on national forests that you can't do in other sets of public lands. And that puts the onus of responsibility on the user. And that's kind of what I get into in the chapter uh, about recreation in the book. Um, I head out with high hopes uh, with a couple friends to ski a 14-er a um, in Colorado, um, a peak over 14,000 feet. 
um, and we uh, we don't make it to the top, uh, run out of uh, oxygen <laughs> and uh, energy. Um, and I use that, and I also couple that story with uh, actually the increasing use in the White Mountains, uh, in particular, uh, the peaks over 4,000 feet. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the 4,000 footer club, um, with, where folks climb all the 4,000 foot peaks, uh, plus peaks in, in uh, New Hampshire, um, most of which are located on the White Mountain. Um, and, and I talk about how uh, the Forest Service doesn't really want to and doesn't really feel like it's 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 responsibility to police recreationists uh, in, in maybe a similar way that we might see the Park Service do. Um, the Forest Service feels like it's up to the stakeholder groups uh, that the 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 uh, cross-country ski groups, the backcountry ski groups, the hiking groups, um, the rock climbing groups. It's up to them to uh, help folks learn how to uh, behave appropriately on national forests. Um, and I think that's a really interesting uh, way to manage uh, recreation. Um, and I think they're doing a pretty good job of that overall. Um, I certainly appreciate the opportunities that are out there on national forests, uh, the lack of red tape, um, the fact that I don't have to um, necessarily get a permit for every last thing that I want to do, uh, which has been uh, my experience on national parks by and large. I'm going to cycle through a few more photos here, uh, again, just to highlight some of the recreation opportunities out on national forests. Uh, this forest uh, is probably familiar to a lot of you. This is a green mountain um, from, uh, from Vermont. And I would imagine many of you uh, have probably uh, ridden this uh, this train up to the top of Mount Washington. Um, and of course, the very top of Mount Washington is a, a state park uh, where the observatory is located, but it is surrounded uh, obviously by the White Mountain National Forest. Um, this is uh, this is my wife uh, stand up paddleboarding on a really neat spot. Um, called Earthquake Lake here in Montana. Um, an earthquake happened uh, in the 1950s, dammed up a river um, and created this lake that's called Earthquake Lake. Um, and this is on the Custer Gallatin. So now you can paddle through this ghost forest. It's pretty cool. Um, and I mentioned uh, at the top of the presentation that uh, roads are a huge uh, opportunity, recreation opportunity, whether you're driving for pleasure, uh, riding an ATV or a bicycle, um, roads uh, in more than 50,000 miles of them crisscross our national forests. This is from Idaho, this particular photo. Uh, this is uh, the Chinese Wall in the Bob Marshall um, Scapegoat Spotted Bear Wilderness Complex here in Montana. And uh, this is a, another scenic byway um, on the Cherokee and Antihala National Forests uh, down in uh, Tennessee and uh, North Carolina. Okay. Um, oh, I just realized I spelled capital wrong on this slide. Uh, yeah, well, authors don't get it right every time. That's why we have spell check. Um, capital W Wilderness uh, is one of the chapters, and I talk a little bit about um, wilderness, how uh, there were th basically three gentlemen uh, who worked for the Forest Service back in the 1930s and 1940s, Aldo Leopold, Arthur Carhart, and Bob Marshall, um, who helped uh, create the concept of wilderness. They had other uh, conspirators who helped them do that, um, but they, uh, they really were pretty foundational to both the concept of wilderness and to uh, the Forest Service ultimately embracing wilderness uh, as a component of its, uh, its management um, and, uh, and, and establishing wilderness areas around the country. Um, only Congress can establish a wilderness area. It's not something that the Forest Service can do on its own. Um, it's not something necessarily that a state can even do on its own. There has to be an act of Congress that establishes that wilderness area. And that area has to be established on existing public lands. So you can't just grab private land and say, this is now a wilderness. And effectively what it does is it just prohibits certain uses. Uh, it prohibits uh, obviously industrial natural resource extraction, even non-industrial natural resource extraction. Um, it prohibits um, motors and motorized uh, recreation. Um, even the forest service can't use chainsaws in wilderness areas to manage them. They have to use crosscut saws and, and horses and mules uh, as well. Um, and so uh, I, I sort of end this chapter, um, not so much looking at the past, um, but uh, recognizing that I think wilderness is actually in a lot of ways about the future. Um, it's about uh, 
setting aside some some sets of, of our public estate where um, where the speed is is by foot and by by horse. Um, and I think that's uh, something we're very fortunate to have as a nation and uh, and something that that I hope continues uh, moving forward. Um, the Forest Service manages, uh, I think, I want to say 30 percent uh, of the wilderness areas in the country. Um, and uh, I think that but but I think they manage the most wilderness acreage of uh, no, I have that backwards. Park Service manages the most wilderness acreage, thanks to Alaska, um, but the Forest Service manages the most number of wilderness units uh, in the wilderness preservation system. Um, and just, I'm going to move through a couple of photos here to, to highlight some of the, the amazing beauty of, of some of these wilderness areas. Um, this is the Alpine Lakes Wilderness uh, up in Washington on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest. Just stunning. Um, this, this wilderness area is permitted because it's pretty popular. Um, and solitude is one of the um, characteristics of wilderness that the Forest Service and other agencies are, are tasked with managing. So that's partially why uh, some of these permits uh, do exist in some of these areas. It's so that you're not overrun uh, with other people. Um, but fortunately, wilderness is not just a Western phenomenon. Um, there's actually some great, uh, the Pemigewasset and other wilderness areas up in New Hampshire. Um, this is the Dolly Sods on the Monongahela down in West Virginia. Um, certainly a pretty stunning landscape. Um, this, uh, this photo here is the, the um, Salmon River, Middle Fork of the Salmon, uh, also known as the River of No Return. Um, and it runs through uh, the Frank Church River of No Return wilderness area, a bit of a mouthful. Frank Church was a, an Idaho legislature who uh, was instrumental in passage of the Wilderness Act. Um, and River of No Return was uh, the old name for the Salmon River. And then of course, um, can't really talk about wilderness without talking about Alaska, um, both capital W wilderness and lowercase wilderness. Um, and the Tongass National Forest, which uh, is the, the country's largest national forest at 17 million acres, um, it has some pretty stunning wilderness, uh, capital W wilderness uh, areas on it, um, including the, the Stikai and Lacant wilderness um, on Alaska's Tongass National Forest. Um, and brief side note, um, Stikine or Stikine, I'm not actually honestly entirely sure how to pronounce it. Um, that was the name of John Muir's dog, uh, who he took up to Alaska when he traveled up there um, in the late 1800s, I think, uh, doing his adventures. And then, of course, I mentioned the Bitterroot, um, and this was a, a photo I snapped a couple summers ago uh, up on the Bitterroot National Forest. Um, no permit required to get here, just had to huff it about six miles. It was pretty spectacular. Okay, uh, probably getting close to my, my time limit here, but I've only got a couple more chapters. Um, the chapter about wildlife I call the Wolverine Watchers. And um, I, I use uh, citizen science as sort of the narrative arc for this chapter. Um, and it, it's a way to talk both about how the Forest Service manages wildlife habitat. Um, the Forest Service itself does not manage wildlife. Those wildlife are managed by state uh, departments of game and fish, natural resources, et cetera. States manage wildlife populations. But uh, the Forest Service, because it manages national forests, it manages wildlife habitat. So it's an important distinction um, and one that I get into in the book, uh, maybe in a little bit too much detail for folks who get a little bored by policy, but nonetheless, um, I use citizen science, which is a, a fairly new type of science that invites uh, the public at large to engage with a science project led by scientists or researchers or federal land management managers. Um, and they go out and they collect science and they help uh, the agency uh, learn more about uh, whatever topic it is that they're investigating. In this instance, uh, I helped with a project here on the Bitterroot National Forest where we set up uh, wildlife camera, uh, motion triggered wildlife cameras. Um, and uh, as you can see in this photo, we, um, <clears throat> we wired um, deer legs to a tree and, uh, and uh, Wolverine came and they ate the deer and um, we got pictures of them. And through this project uh, where we went out every weekend uh, all winter long and replaced batteries and replaced uh, hauled out deer legs and rewired them to a tree, um, we were able to help the Forest Service learn that there are um, close to a dozen Wolverine in the Bitterroot National Forest. There's breeding pair of Wolverine in the Bitterroot National Forest. Um, we, learn, we helped them learn where they live, 
uh, where they move. Um, and all of that was information that they really couldn't get. You know, that there's one staff biologist um, and there were over a hundred volunteers any given uh, winter for this. So citizen science is really enabling the Forest Service and other agencies to improve uh, the knowledge that they have about their public lands, our public lands and how they manage them. Um, and of course, uh, you can't talk about wildlife without throwing a few cute wildlife photos in there. Um, this is a baby flammulated owl, probably one of the cutest photos I've ever seen. Uh, this is from a forest in Utah. And uh, we've got a, a mountain goat kid. Uh, they're hard to to not want to uh, pet, though we don't definitely don't want to pet them. Um, super cute. That one is up in uh, Washington as well. And, you know, we talk about wildlife, charismatic wildlife, like mountain goats and, and owls. Um, but also, um, you know, there are uh, there there are, are flora in addition to the fauna out there. Um, and the Indio National Forest in California is home to uh, some of the oldest living organisms on earth. Um, and this is a bristlecone pine, um, the oldest uh, known uh, species or known individual of bristlecone pine lives on the Inyo. Um, and it is more than I think 4,800 years old, a single tree, 4,800 years old. Absolutely amazing. Um, it's called Methuselah. Um, and uh, you can go out and, and see the grove where uh, Methuselah is, um, but you, they do not have a sign telling you which tree it is because uh, as, as I put in the book, humans can't be trusted with such magnificent secrets. Um, this is another really cool example of, of some flora. This is the, um, the Pando Aspen clone. Um, and this is considered one of the largest organisms on the planet. Um, it's massive Aspen clone themselves. Um, and this, uh, they think this clone has been around for tens of thousands of years, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, it's a huge, uh, basically single organism that has just regenerated itself um, for thousands of years, which is pretty cool. Okay. After the burn, uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Two more chapters. Um, this this chapter focuses on uh, on the Eagle Creek fire that I I, I might have mentioned earlier, but I'm not sure if I did. It happened on the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, um, just east of Portland, back in 2017. Uh, some teenagers were playing with fireworks uh, Labor Day weekend and uh, caught the forest on fire. It was pretty dry. Um, and I, I use this particular fire as a, as a way to, again, build a narrative around, um, around wildfire, which is obviously one of the most pressing issues facing uh, national forests, uh, and, and, and particularly out west, but um, national forests and the Forest Service in general. Um, and this is a mult, uh, mult, well, I can't think of it. Multnomah Lodge, uh, excuse me, um, on uh, on the Columbia River National Gorge, and uh, there was a pretty heroic effort to save it um, from the from the fire. Um, a lot of the Forest Service's uh, initial attitude toward fire was informed by. Uh, an event that happened in 1910 called the Big Burn or the Great Burn. It was a huge, massive uh, 3 million acre wildfire that happened in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, up into British Columbia, um, killed something like 85 uh, people um, and uh, just decimated the forests uh, and, and was pretty tough on, on a fairly young agency. The, the Forest Service had only been around for about five years. After this, uh, after this fire, the Forest Service implemented a policy called the Out by 10 policy. Um, where they required uh, every fire that was spotted on a national forest to be put out by 10 a.m. the next morning. Um, and that policy basically lasted up until the late 1980s uh, and even into the early 1990s um, when it was replaced by what they call the let it burn policy, um, which allows wildfires to burn as long as they're not threatening private property or lives. Um, and uh, that shift happened in large part because of the Yellowstone fires of 1988, which some folks might remember. And the Forest Service and, and its scientists and others started to realize that, you know, all of these forests, whether they're in the east or the west, are actually fire dependent ecosystems. They require fire um, to regenerate. They require fire for all sorts of reasons. And we hadn't allowed that fire to come through. So currently we have a situation um, where our forests have uh, a lot of fuel that hasn't burned like it used to every 25 or 30 years. It hasn't burned in 100 years. Um, we have uh, drier conditions being uh, caused by climate change. Um, and uh, we have a uh, longer fire season, again, being caused by climate change. We also have more people living closer to forests, which, which makes those fires that do happen um, and when they need to protect that private property and those lives more expensive to fight. 
Um, so I use the Eagle Creek fire uh, as a way to tell that story and to talk a little bit about forest policy. Um, it was a really interesting story. The public outpouring uh, of support was amazing. Um, the, the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area is beloved by Oregonians, in particular um, folks from Portland. Um, and so after that fire, um, <clears throat> the public really responded. And that was a little uncharacteristic, I think, of, of some of the other responses uh, that that national forests in more rural areas get when they uh, burn. Um, but I thought it was a really interesting story to tell. Um, this photo is actually from, uh, from the Eagle Creek fire, um, which actually uh, really wasn't that damaging to the forest at all. 85% um, of it, I think, burned at moderate uh, severity. So it was actually, again, relatively health healthy for, uh, for the landscape itself and, and for the forest. Um, you know, you can't hike around Montana um, for very long without running into a scene like this. Um, just the charred trees, they're, they're kind of everywhere out here. Um, but beneath those charred trees, as you can see in this photo, there is a carpet of green. Um, there are new seedlings growing up, there's new plants growing up. Um, that fire recycled those nutrients back into the soil um, and it allows for, for that new growth. Um, and it's just part of the process. Okay, the final chapter, um, and I hope I haven't run too, too long here. I'm not looking at the clock. Um, all the people's land. This is where I talk a little bit about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, some of the, the uh, maybe sort of uh, more frustrating aspects of, of, of the Forest Service's history um, has been, uh, had been, although they've, they've changed uh, pretty drastically, I think, um, uh, some of that lack of diversity, that, that lack of equity and inclusion, and not just the Forest Service, um, which I don't actually really focus on all that much in the chapter, but uh, society at large. Uh, and I talk a lot about uh, outdoor media and how um, outdoor media hasn't really represented uh, people of color. Um, conservation nonprofits have had a hard time uh, including people of color uh, and diversity in, in their member roles or, or on their boards. Um, and, you know, when you look through at least four or five years ago, when you looked through a, an REI catalog or a Cabela's catalog, um, just about all those people in those catalogs were fit white people. Um, that has changed now, um, I think, or it's starting to change. Uh, and I think that's a really good thing. So I, I talk a little bit about some of that outdoor media, some of the folks that are trying to change that outdoor media. Um, and I talk a little bit about some of the history of, uh, of diversity in the Forest Service. Um, this photo is, uh, is of a... a Airborne infantry, infantry, uh, or, or excuse me, an airborne um, firefighting brigade called the Triple Nickels, um, which was an all African American paratroop. Uh, 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 group uh, from World War II um, that was tasked with putting out fires on national forests that were uh, started by um, fire balloons that were launched by the Japanese. Uh, so actually the Japanese uh, launched uh, balloons into the air over the Pacific, uh, lit them on fire in the hopes that they would land uh, in, in forests in the Pacific Northwest and the West and, and catch the forests on fire. And this uh, all black battalion was, uh, was responsible for jumping out of airplanes and putting those fires out. Um, so a pretty cool uh, brief history of, of one aspect of, uh, of, uh, diversity in the national forests. Um, and I also speak about gender diversity, um, both uh, historic and, and current uh, gender diversity. Um, this is a, a girls club of the Forest Service um, they, uh, from, from 1939 in, uh, in Wisconsin. Um, and this I think is a, is a great uh, example of uh, some of the efforts that are happening now uh, on national forests. This is from the Tuskegee National Forest in Alabama. Um, it's the smallest national forest in the country. It's only 11,000 acres. Um, but when the Forest Service uh, solicits the help of Smoky Bear um, and makes a concerted effort to outreach to different communities, um, those communities respond. And I think this, uh, this photo exemplifies that. Um, I will say, um, the book, any book, uh, ends up being a little bit dated. Um, and since uh, I wrote the book, and and between then and now, um, the Forest Service actually has its first ever um, African American chief in Randy Moore, um, which was really exciting. He was appointed uh, just a few months ago, um, and I think that's just a really exciting uh, development for the Forest Service. Um, you know, the Park Service uh, now has an acting uh, acting director who uh, is a Native American, and of course uh, the uh, Secretary of interior, Deb Haaland, um, is also uh, a Native American. So I, I do think institutionally a lot of progress has been made, um, even if uh, 
if, if folks uh, of color may not feel as comfortable out on national forests yet as we all would wish that they do, um, or aren't don't have the opportunity to get out on national forests to the degree that we wish they would, um, I do think institutionally there's some progress. Okay, woo! Thank you so much for listening and for uh, what I'm sure was your rapt attention. Um, I. Uh, I think that's about it. Um, I really look forward to answering some questions. I hope there are some, um, and I'm really grateful for, DL, for you all for, uh, for joining me. Thank you so much. All right. So Greg, I'm going to have you stop your share and then yes. we'll come in and we'll start answering, asking and answering some questions. We do have one here from Lauren who says, were any national forests converted into national parks in 1916 or later? For example, was Yosemite originally a national forest? Oh, that actually is stumping me a little bit, to be honest. Um, I would guess yes. Um, though, pro well, actually, I don't know. The reverse might actually be more likely now that I think about it, where um, a, a national forest was converted into a national park. Was that the question? I'm sorry, yeah. I, I got lost already. Yes, I think that probably did happen. I don't know of the actual uh, occurrence of that happening, but my guess is that yes, it probably did. Um, great question. One I am going to research because I am now curious. Thank you. Book number two, I guess. Uh, Janine yeah. wants to know, <laughs> which is your favorite forest? Ah, uh, yes. Can you really have a favorite question. forest? Is it like children you're not supposed to say? <laughs> no, I'm happy to say. Um, I think it's driven by proximity for me. I am, I'm spoiled to live uh, so close to the Lolo, which I mentioned, and to the Bitterroot, which you saw a couple photos from. Um, and I get to spend uh, a lot of time in both of those places. So they've just grown uh, to be really, uh, really beloved by me. Um, I I'm, I'm regret the, the lack of time that I've spent in the White Mountains. And I really look forward to getting there. Uh, my, all, my whole family still lives in Maine. And uh, it's, it's a place that I, I really want to get to and explore a little bit more. I, I, I love those hardwood forests of New England uh, and Appalachia. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, I, I think just because I live there and spend so much time uh, near these places, the Lolo and the Bitterroot are, are probably my two favorites. Um, you mentioned hardwood forests in New Hampshire. And I had a question. New Hampshire's forest is uh, now is actually not really it's it's fairly young um, because of logging and farmland clearing a lot of our old growth disappeared and what we see now is pretty much 100 years or less old um, and when you go hiking you'll often find stone walls from old farm boundaries how different is old growth forest from new I mean a hundred years doesn't sound new to me as a human, but to a tree is a hundred year old new growth forest different from old growth. Sure. Uh, yes, they are different. Um, <clears throat> There's so much science going on right now about forests and, and ancient forests, old growth forests in particular. It's pretty fascinating. Um, you know, the, the networks of roots sort of talk to each other. Um, they do that in part through uh, mushrooms, actually, which help uh, sort of translate chemical uh, signals to the trees. Um, so I think just the entire ecosystem in an old growth forest is that much older. So the, the soil components are, are that much older. The fungi have been there for that much longer. Um, there's, you know, to be honest, not as much of the West as old growth forest as we might wish it were either. Um, and a lot of the forests out here um, and, and a lot of the photos that you saw are, you know, 100 or 150 years old out here as well. Um, that being said, we certainly have some pockets. Um, this fall, I was able to, to go to an area called the Ross Creek Cedars. Um, and it is just so humbling to be uh, in an area where, you know, the trees are several hundred years old. It takes three, four people to wrap your arms around one of these cedar trees. Um, and you can just kind of feel that, uh, I guess, that energy that's a little bit different um, in those old growth forests. That being said, um, you know, a hundred year old forest does a pretty dang good job of keeping those streams running clean and clear and providing those recreation opportunities and, and uh, the wildlife habitat as well. So um, while they may not be as old, uh, I certainly think they're still super valuable. <laughs> Excellent. Rachel wants to know, what was the inspiration for this book? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... So in part, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have worked at the National Forest Foundation uh, 
sorry, I've done quite a few interviews and presentations. I get a little turned around as to whether I introduce my my career or not, but I worked at the National Forest Foundation for a long time. Um, and so I was able to uh, to understand that that Americans, I think a lot of Americans don't know as much about national forests as they might. And so I think part of the inspiration for writing the book was to help share what I had learned and, and the passion that I've developed for national forests with uh, with folks. Um, I've always wanted to, to be a writer. Um, and when I was at the, the National Forest Foundation, uh, we were actually approached by Timber Press um, to uh, potentially collaborate with them on a book about national forests. This was just after the Eagle Creek fire that I talked about in the presentation. Um, and in those conversations uh, I ended up having with the editor, um, we realized that there were a lot of stories out there about national forests that needed to be told. And uh, he agreed that that just Americans didn't know as much about these landscapes uh, that national parks tended to take most of the air out of the room. And so uh, through that opportunity and, and uh, my desire to, to sort of share more about these landscapes, uh, the book came about and I feel super grateful that they, uh, Timber Press gave me the chance to, to write it and I was able to uh, take advantage of some of the foundation of knowledge that I that I'd had built up at the at the NFF over the years. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. To our viewers at home, our National Forest is available from Gibson's Bookstore. And as we mentioned earlier, the holidays are coming, and I think would make an ideal gift for the hiker in your life. <clears throat> Thank you so much to Greg M. Peters for joining us this evening, um, all the way from across the country, Missoula, Montana, in his beautiful national forest, from him all the way to us here near the White Mountains. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. And uh, sorry to keep you all a little bit late. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you everybody as well for weathering through our tech issues tonight. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Take care.